One of the things I was told before going to North Korea by friends who spent a lot of time, if they offer you a drink, say yes. And I said, why? And they said, because it makes them more comfortable. Mm -hmm. They're more likely to talk. So strangely enough, when you're writing about North Korea, you end up drinking a fair amount. <laughs>
Kevin Osnos, staff writer at The New Yorker, runs the foreign policy beat, just got back from North Korea, the People's Republic, and uh, great to be with you, man. Thanks for having me. So let's start with the obvious. They let you in. It wasn't the first time you uh, had done the Axis of Evil tour back over 10 years ago, Iraq, Iran, and North Korea. I mean, you know, it must have felt pretty different after 13 years. I guess the first question is a little personal, which is, you freak out a little bit when you go in there? I have to say, if you're not really agitated when you're going to North Korea, you're not paying attention. And, and that's a kind of malpractice as a journalist. So I was, you know, I, I feel like I've worked in a lot of some rough places over the years, and I've never been in a place where I was as tense as I was in North Korea. And I came out at the end of it and, and had this kind of huge sense of relief. And everybody I know who's, who's, who's done this kind of work has that feeling in North Korea. And I think for a very simple reason, which is that it is utterly outside of your control about how things will go. And that's not always the truth. In war zones, sometimes you do have more, more control. You decide who your driver is. And if something goes wrong, there may be a foreign embassy that can help you. In North Korea, you don't have a way of contacting people uh, very easily, so. And you had gone over right after the Otto Warmbier uh, right. coma and death, the yeah. young American that was over there. Did that make you feel more comfortable and confident because they wouldn't want that to happen again? Or did it make you feel like really anything could happen? No, I, I was I was very aware of the fact that I didn't want to become part of the problem in the sense that everybody who I talked to before I went, national security experts, people in government and now outside, people in the intelligence community had said, we think you can go, just don't make a mistake. Because if you make a mistake, you may find yourself in the center of the negotiation, and you don't want to be part of that story. And so I was really worried that if something went wrong, I was going to be tying the hands of the United States government in terms of how they negotiate with North Korea over their nuclear and weapons program. Um, so I was I was acutely aware of the fact that you know the way that they had mistreated Otto Warmbier, the way that he was charged with this crime, was a precedent. And I thought, I was going in the front door, I was a journalist, they knew who I was. So the chances of them going out of their way to make an international incident out of me was less likely from my perspective, but you just never know. So as you're prepping for this trip, it's now the Trump administration, a little different, right? How does that go? I went and saw the New York Channel, as it's known. These are the North Korean diplomats in New York. I saw them again last week. Uh, so after I came back from North Korea, and after the tweets about Little Rocket Man. Right. And what they said to me was, what do you expect we're gonna do here? We are in an impossible position because when your president personally attacks our leader, we have to respond as if that is a message from your, from your head of your government. You know, this is, people are telling us to ignore the tweets. People are telling us they don't matter. But they have to matter. How can we treat them as if they don't? I mean, Kim Jong-un historically was not the one making any of the statements towards the United States. That was always coming from the propaganda arms of the government. Only recently did we see that first statement that came from Kim Jong-un himself. Was that while you were there? It was after I was there. And it was a big deal. I mean, that's unprecedented yeah. for him to put his name, his face to it. He's appearing on, as I saw, on televisions all over the country. I mean, if you're sitting in a restaurant, the TV is always on, and there is more chances than not that it's going to have something about politics. But to turn it on and see Kim Jong-un speaking directly to you, North Korean citizen, and also to the rest of the world, that's a very rare event. And so what that means is that he's staking his personal credibility to it within this very complicated and dangerous political dynamic that he has at home. So he can't back down at this point, your no. perspective is? Uh, my view is he's locked in. Yeah. In um, a way that Trump really isn't. Trump has mobility. You know, For Trump, this is his choice to make. It didn't have to get to the point, though, where he constrained Kim Jong-un's options. I think that's one of the decisions along the way that where Trump has frankly sort of departed from his own national security staff. You know, they had made very clear advice to him over the course of the last eight, nine months. You can say whatever you want on North Korea, but we recommend that you do not personalize this because that's going to limit North Korea's options. So a nickname, for example, would a not like be their recommendation. <laughs> a little rocket man. Yeah. You know, he jumped the guardrails yeah. at a certain point, and yeah. Trump just went rogue, diplomatically speaking, and decided to do this. And now they're trying to pick up the pieces. So let's get to North Korea itself, right? So you're there, and I get one of the things that strikes me as most interesting about North Korea is this idea that you have a completely totalitarian state, but at the same time, 
um, you also have more and more contact with the outside world. Did you have enough exposure to understand what was going on there? Yeah, this is a, a remarkable place to visit in 2017 in the sense that this is as close as you will ever get to a true totalitarian state. Yes, there are cell phones, but the cell phones operate only within the country. And the internet that they have is actually an intranet. You know, right. it doesn't have access to stuff outside. It's what the Iranians want to set up, actually. Right, and yeah. what the Chinese would love to have. Yep. And none of these other countries have ever been able to pull it off. Mm -hmm. North Korea is operating in the sort of platonic ideal of a totalitarian regime. Yeah, they're in the cave. They are. But, do, but are they still but just as in the no, cave? No, that's the key point. Yeah. You're absolutely right to raise it. I mean, what's happened... Over the course of the last 20 years, something big changed in North Korea, which is that after the famine ended in about 1998, yep. they were never able to close off the borders again the way they had before. And so there was all this permeability. And one of the things that began to come in was South Korean movies and television, to the point that now, if you're an elite in Pyongyang, you will sometimes hear fellow elites using a South Korean accent when they speak, which is a... Uh, it's a status symbol. It's a, an indication of cosmopolitanism that you are sort of plugged into the outside Which is world. okay? No. That's a good thing? It's not okay. So how is that allowed in the because, world's totalitarian state? Because they are privileged. They are at the top. And they're running a risk. I mean, part of the status symbol is showing that you have the personal confidence and the connections to sort of try that out. But let's be clear, if you are a person out in the countryside, or if you're somebody of low status, or you're somebody without connections in the capital, and you are found with a South Korean movie or television, mm -hmm. you can be thrown into the gulag. That's very much the case. So what they're dealing with is a moment now where Kim Jong-un knows that his elites are aware of the outside world. They're aware that this is not the socialist paradise that they were always trained to believe it is. Right. And so he has to try to allow them some measure of lifestyle improvement, some measure of normalcy. Let them move money to Switzerland. Let them send their kids to China for college. Because otherwise, then he really is at risk. South Korea lives in a very strange place because, on the one hand, they have to go about their daily lives, so they can't think about the fact that they've got Kim Jong-un 30 miles over the border. On the other hand, you know, it's, I think there's something of a myth that they are living a delusion. You know, they know the risks. And they're, as much as this has damaged the North Korean populace living under Kim Jong-un, the division of the peninsula has had a profound effect on South Korean politics, too. It's one of the reasons why we see so much sort of turbulence and drama and simple weirdness in Korean politics. So let's talk a little bit about your impressions when you were there, right? Uh, what, what surprised you, uh, given the way it's being covered around the world, when you actually got an experience? I mean, one is obviously the economy is doing better than most people understand. Right. How did that become obvious and evident to you, but also just, you know, general sort of unusual impressions. Well, one of the things is, is surprising that, you know, North Korea, for all of the sanctions against it, for all the deprivation and isolation, it is actually a country that is in the capital growing. You know, you see new buildings going up. There are new cars on the road. The you metro know, system is being The built. metro system is yeah. working. You know, there are, you know, black limousines honking at you and, and, and sort of, you know, threatening to run you over, as there are in other authoritarian countries, which is faintly sort of reassuring because the absence of cars would be another thing. But, and I think this is important to mention, that if you follow North Korea closely and you read a lot about it these days, you read a lot about this kind of economic growth. And I think some of that has gone too far in the analysis. The reality is... It is a more isolated and, and um, impoverished place than we sometimes remember. I mean, it, this is still a country that has a GDP per capita that is on the level of Haiti. It is poorer than Yemen. So, you know, when we talk about it having economic growth and that giving Kim Jong-un options and so on, I think we have to make sure we keep that in perspective. And that actually surprised me. I'd spent so much time among smart analysts of North Korea thinking about the way in which economic reform was happening that I'd gone too far in imagining that this was like China in about 1976, and it's not. It's China at most in about 1968 in the depths of the Cultural Revolution, when the dominant experience that anybody has on a given day is political and ideological and the fear of being ratted out by your neighbor. Yeah. A little bit of economic improvement goes a lot in way, though, in yeah. the environment, right? I mean, we don't have the stories of them eating tree bark anymore. In no, I mean, there is still 70% of the population receives some sort of food assistance, but there is this tremendous gap between the rich and the poor, which is really taken off. And some of the most interesting conversations I have are with North Koreans outside of North Korea. So mm. in South Korea, I spent a lot of time with defectors. And one of the things they told me was that these days, the status symbol you want, if you're super rich in Pyongyang, is 
a piano. And they said, it doesn't matter if you can play it. If you have a, a new Yamaha piano, $22,000 to get a new one, $8,000 to get a used one, that's a signal to your other fellow elites that you are playing at a certain kind of level. A lot of this development that you see in North Korea today, sometimes some of the big buildings in the capital, for instance, are being built with private money. It's a strange setup where basically if you're an elite that's made some money from corruption or through the black market or through the official economy, you're expected to then donate that money, quite literally donate it back into the government so that they can then build these big marquee projects. So they are really stitched into this, to this government. And I think it's one of the reasons why we should not be expecting North Korean elites to rise up tomorrow and overthrow this leader despite the mismanagement of... When you talk to the North Koreans, you did both the politicos and not, how aware of the dangers uh, that they face uh, were they? You know, I think the, in, in many ways the most telling moment of my visit to North Korea was a very quiet moment. It was over lunch where I was sitting with my minder, who's an analyst at the North Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Smart guy. Yeah. Just Speaks that one or there were other English. folks there? There were always other folks yeah. in the background. So they haven't changed that, yeah. No. Okay. But in this case, you know, we're having an honest conversation. I mean, uh, one of the things I was told before going to North Korea by friends who spent a lot of time working on it, analyzing it, they said, if they offer you a drink, say yes. And I said, why? And they said, because it makes them more comfortable. Mm -hmm. They're more likely to talk. So strangely enough, when you're writing about North Korea, you end up drinking a fair amount. <laughs> So here we are at lunch having a North Korean beer and we're watching on television as Kim Jong-un comes on the screen and says that he might rain terror down upon the United States. I'm paraphrasing here, but it was a version of the same idea that we've heard over and over. And I, and I turned to my counterpart, this guy named Park Sung-il, who's 35 years old, has a five-year-old son, speaks perfect English. I mean, it's sort of a plugged-in guy. And I said, Give me a break. Do you honestly imagine, honestly, mm -hmm. that you could have a nuclear exchange with the United States that would not be a cataclysm for you and for the rest of the world? And he said, yes. You know, we have suffered terribly in our history. We've survived the Korean War. We survived the famine. And we would survive this too. Not everyone, he said, but some. Mm -hmm. And that is a chilling message to get from somebody who is not a lunatic. You know, this is not a jihadist in a cave who is muttering about martyrdom. This is a man who works for the government, who is as plugged in as anybody in North Korea, has access to the internet, and is telling me as lucidly as possible that he really believes that the North Korean self-narrative is such that if necessary, they would survive an encounter with the United States. Well, certainly the willingness of the North Koreans to take pain is a hell of a lot greater than the average person in the developed world, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a narrative we've seen before. And it's really part of their self-image, which is sometimes we overlook from afar. But, you know, they take pride in the fact that they were eating bark in the 90s and lived through it. You know, they take pride in the fact that they've been an enemy of the United States for 70 years and have not succumbed. So the sanctions that are being hit by them right now, including by China, are something that also makes them feel stronger we can overcome? I think the sanctions, yeah, they're part of the sense of encirclement, and that does feed the domestic narrative, so it's useful for them politically. But I also think the sanctions are having more bite now than we really anticipated. There was an argument, if we'd had this conversation two years ago, everybody in the business would have said sanctions are not having an effect. Um, now they're not saying that. What they're saying is that some of the sanctions, particularly secondary sanctions on Chinese companies and banks, are beginning to have an impact. The problem is, is that when, it, when there is so much manufactured chaos at the top of the American government that is undermining the Secretary of State's ability to operate, the message that's received in Pyongyang is not, wow, this is uh, carefully calibrated ambiguity of the kind that you know, has defined nuclear brinkmanship since 1945. Right. It's that they are confused and that they are sending mixed messages. That's the part where I feel like it's missing, it's missing an opportunity. Let's, before we close, let's talk a little bit about um, our favorite president because mm. you wrote this big piece and it was a, a couple months before the election. Kind of everyone in your position was saying, never gonna happen. Uh, here we are a year later. Uh, what's different? How's it evolved? I hate to say it, Ian, because it sounds like totally smug, but like, in that piece, people said to me, here's the things we worry about. He's going to use Twitter as a tool of statecraft. He's going to react in national security crises in ways that are going to be unhelpful. He's going to uh, antagonize and create chaos within his senior leadership, which is going to bog down the government. In many ways, a lot of those things have turned out to be true. Um, you know, he hasn't launched a nuclear weapon yet. And we did say that that might happen. Yeah. So in that fun, sense, fun, fun. but okay, let me yeah, push actually, back. I have to realize. Twitter, I haven't Twitter about that piece saying in a while. that he's using Twitter yeah, in, as statecraft, right? Yeah. I mean, he's certainly using it to rile up his base. I mean, I could easily argue 
that Trump is not using Twitter in any way um, as an instrument of statecraft, but rather he's using it as an instrument of domestic politics, which, by the way, he's reasonably effective at. How do you push back against that? There's just no question that when he does the things he does, it undermines Rex Tillerson. When he says, Rex, you're wasting your time, when he makes it known via his Twitter account that this man might be out of a job, if you're the foreign minister of a country, the kinds of people you meet with all the time, Ian, how do you make a choice to invest in a guy like Rex Tillerson? Because you don't have any real belief that he's going to be there. What's impressed you the most? with uh, the first year so far of the Trump administration? What do you think that they've done the best that you wouldn't have expected? Pregnant pause. Definitely. Pregnant pause. No, you got to be able to do this. <laughs> and this is not theatrical. Like, no. I am truly... I understand. Like, you are talking to somebody who is having a hard time taking an issue that I think that they have done well. I mean, I'd argue this is part of the problem, <laughs> right? That I that that members of the so I go mean, ahead. I, no, I the, consider you one around. of the brightest guys. Let me turn out the question around on, on you. Let me stuff. turn the question around. I mean, I think in yeah. fairness, genuinely, what? Name something that you think they've done really well in the first year. Well, look, I, I certainly think the access uh, that the business community has had to the Trump administration is vastly greater. You talk to an average CEO, they feel so much better. But what um, about the Steve Schwartzman council that had to be disbanded? Yeah, but that was a council. If you get rid of the theatrics in the New York Times and on CNN every day and talk about the way people are actually discussing But it. it's not theatrics when you have a president who is, in effect, enabling and emboldening the work of neo-Nazis and white supremacists. That's not theatrical. That's core to, the, I, to America's ability I, to function as a no republic. There's no question that Trump's willingness to use identity politics and race to advance his uh, supporters and distract from other issues has had effects which are negative and, er and corrosive of American institutions and values. I accept that. But that wasn't the question. The question that I asked you and then you refused to answer because right. you couldn't think of something yeah. and said and to me was, what's he done well? Here's something he's done well. Again, you talk to those CEOs. You go around and, right. and they will actually tell you. I mean, I would say that the U.S.-India relationship uh, is probably warmer today than it was under Obama. The U.S.-Japan relationship is warmer today than it was under Obama. I'm pushing you because, again, I think that if you don't have that answer ready. I mean, the fact that we haven't had any major legislation over the course of the last year is a profound fact. One example that I think sometimes does get overlooked is that I think he has shaken up the relationship with China. The problem is, is that they've also come to believe that he's a paper tiger and that he can be rolled. That his simple lack of information and the incoherence of the leadership around him makes it easy for them to achieve their aims. So on the one hand, yes, they have done a good job in putting China on notice, but they haven't been able to follow through. Well, backhanded compliment is better than none. Evan Osnos, a pleasure to be with you. We'll be talking soon. I enjoyed it. Thanks, Ian.